Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this year's AFA lecture. Uh, I'm Monica Piazzesi. I'm going to introduce Yuri Gorotnichenko uh, from uh, Berkeley. He's, um, Yuri is the, the Quantage Presidential Professor at UC Berkeley. He's a macroeconomist, and uh, it's the tradition of the AFA lecture uh, that we invite an economist uh, to tell us uh, what's going on in their discipline, uh, which would be relevant for us. And so this year's lecture is about something that is super relevant for finance, which is expectations. Uh, expectations are extremely relevant for us because we need to figure out what agents expect of the future that's going to be reflected in asset prices. It's going to affect trading and many other things. So you is really the perfect person uh, to come and tell us about his work on expectations. Uh, let me uh, say a few more words about Yuri, who is a leading macroeconomist whose work uh, is deeply admired. And so we, uh, it's hard to summarize his work because it's um, on very many different topics. So the work is really ranging uh, monetary policy, business cycles, fiscal policy, uh, taxation, economic growth. Uh, so Euro in, Yuri in his work covers a broad spectrum of different topics. Uh, uh, and I would say in recent years uh, has been particularly known for this work on expectations. And so this is what uh, he's going to update us on. Uh, and again, as I said, it's a work that is close to our hearts as financial economists. So this is great. I should also say that Yuri is from Ukraine, where he went to college, uh, and then before then doing his PhD uh, in economics at Michigan. And since, the, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Yuri has been very involved with policy issues in Ukraine. Uh, Yuri is, uh, leads the Ukrainian initiative at, the, at CIPAR, uh, which the, is the European equivalent of the NBER. Uh, and that initiative analyzes policies for Ukraine. Uh, it put out a blueprint for the reconstruction of Ukraine. So if you're interested, I encourage you to go to Yuri's website and check out what this group of people uh, that consists of people from Ukraine, but also many other economists that help in this initiative uh, to contribute thinking about policies uh, for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, but for today, for now, uh, let's welcome Yuri. Uh, he's going to talk about subjective expectations and decisions. Thank you. So we'll have roughly an hour of talk, and then we'll do Q&A. Uh, and so here's a mic, and so later we'll uh, please come to the mic so that everyone hears your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Monica, for this very generous introduction and obviously the invitation to come and give this lecture. I should say a lot of my research agenda uh, is a function of various editorial decisions that Monica made at JP many years ago. So I assume that you know if it were not her, I would not be here, uh, you know, here uh, either today. Now I'll talk about subjective expectations because almost every decision we make in our lives is going to depend on what we think about the future, you know, what will happen to us in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year, in 10 years. Uh, like for example, AEA has to plan 10 years ahead where it's going to have its, you know, conferences and what format they sh should have for those conferences. But it's not just AEA, obviously. It, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's relevant for everyone. How much to consume, how much to save, uh, what kind of investment we want to make, uh, what prices we want to set, how many people we want to employ, what kind of education we want to have. And so it's not just you know, macroeconomics where expectations are extremely important. It's, it's finance, it's, it's trade. Um, basically, any field in economics is one way or another is going to depend on expectations. Now, to keep my uh, talk uh, relatively short, I will focus on inflation expectations. Uh, but even this niche uh, subject in terms of expectations is very relevant for macroeconomists financial economists and many others. Because you know, so many decisions we make are going to have an intertemporal component. For example, inflation expectations are going to show up in the Phillips curve, in the oil equation, in asset pricing, and in how we set monetary policy. So there are many, many dimensions where inflation expectations are going to enter. And this is just a small slice of expectations we have to care about. 
Now, given the importance of, you know, for example, inflation expectations, you would think that we have everything worked out. We by now know where these expectations come from, how people form them, how they collect and process information. But the reality is different. And just to give you a sense of what people sort of in the trenches think about inflation expectations, let me quote a few uh, uh, Fed chairs. This is from Alan Greenspan many years ago. He was talking about you know, the, the importance of inflation expectations at the time when there were lots of fears about inflation uh, getting out of control. And he said, look, we don't really know what it is, but it doesn't mean it's important. And kind of in the rest of his speech, he was talking about the importance of learning more about inflation expectations and using them for policy. Some years later, Ben Bernanke gives another major speech about inflation and inflation expectations. And here, he makes a very similar message. We don't have complete answers. It's really important. It has a lot of practical uh, relevance. And you know, for some uh, sectors in the economy, specifically for firms, trade unions, and others who set prices in the economy, we know particularly little. And so we have to do something about this. He, he was calling for more research in, in this area. Now, you move forward, Janet Yellen, 10 years later, another speech about inflation and the importance of inflation expectations. And again, she is talking about that we need to know more because this is so important for understanding macroeconomic dynamics and for setting policy. So again, she was saying, we don't know much about inflation expectations. We need more research on this subject. And obviously, if I continue using various Fed chairs or the ECB presidents or other governors, you will all see that they want to know more about inflation expectations, and they want to use inflation expectations in their uh, decision making. Now, this may give you an impression that we know nothing about inflation expectation, and that would be not fair uh, to give this description. We actually made a lot of progress over time. Maybe we don't know everything, we don't have complete answers, but we certainly know a lot more than we used to. And just to give you kind of a sense of how much progress we have made over the years, if you go back to early macroeconomic models in the 50s and 60s, you never see expectations there. It's kind of striking. For example, in terms of inflation expectations, you know, all these macroeconomists, forecasters will talk about you know, inflation mindset or psychology of inflation, but they will never have an expectation term in their equations. Now, we know these models failed miserably in the 70s, and, and we have the rational expectations revolution where agents with you know, some exaggeration know everything about everything. They know the structure of the economy, they know the shocks in the economy, they can calculate optimal strategies for themselves and for everybody else in the economy, and so they can very quickly figure out you know, what should happen in the next year, two years, or 10 years. Now, obviously, this is an extreme um, assumption, but it has a number of benefits. It forces us to think through a number of issues to make our expectations consistent with models, to make sure that we, we can be really too wrong in our thinking about you know, various developments in the economy. On the other hand, it's also clearly unrealistic. We don't have any human being uh, on this planet that can do this kind of exercise, and obviously a lot of work was trying to find the middle ground, which has the beauty of full information rational expectations, where you have a lot of discipline in our models, a lot of discipline, a lot of parsimony. That's a good thing in macroeconomic models. But also have more realism that not everybody has perfect information, that not everybody has a PhD in economics, that not everybody has uh, you know, daily routine of reading various financial news. Um, and so we have to find you know, this middle ground somewhere. And there was a lot of work over the years. Uh, in, in a nutshell, we have kind of two strands of research here. One is to relax rationality and say, well, you know, people just don't understand something, and this is kind of a feature of, of human beings. Um, you know, there are some pros and cons of doing this. Another route is to assume that you don't have full information. It's just you know, too costly to process and collect information. So we kind of get satisfied with you know, limited knowledge and use this limited knowledge to the best of our ability. But we can have all sorts of combinations and permutations of various departures from full information rational expectations. So a lot of work over the years to try to find this middle ground. Now, having said this, uh, you know, it's still true that in, uh, in macroeconomics, and I think to maybe to a smaller extent in finance, people increasingly uh, continue, I mean, they increasingly 
rely on uh, full information radiation expectations. So at least it's not you know, a, a new uh, thing there. Um, and this is really remarkable because when you look at the history of full information radiation expectations, nobody would have predicted that this kind of framework is going to take over the world. You know, there was this paper in the early 60s by Moose saying that we we'll have to use model consistent expectations. But it took Bob Lucas to really revolutionize macroeconomics and change the field forever. And so when you look, for example, at what kind of models are used uh, by practitioners, you know, central bankers, you know, uh, various you know, financial institutions, almost all of them are relying on some form of fire. Right? So people have rationality. They have full information. And this is the driving force, uh, the key building block in our models. Now, because this is so core to the macroeconomic uh, research and many other fields, obviously lots of people wanted to test this assumption. Do we really have full information, rational expectations, and so on? And uh, it's a giant literature, thousands of papers. So I'm not going to do justice to this amazing work, but I would say that the, the, the gist of this research agenda is very clear. You look at the survey evidence, which measures expectations, and you see massive departures from full information rational expectations, especially at shorter and medium uh, term horizons. You know, if you look at longer term uh, situations, it's more likely that FIRE, full information rational expectations, is going to be a better description of the world. But in the medium term, short term, we are very, very far from uh, FIRE in, in, in survey evidence. And this is reflected in you know, so many dimensions. You know, lots of differences in beliefs about where inflation is going, how it's going to shape, what are the sources of inflation, different interpretations. There are many, many things that should not happen if you live in a fire world. Let me give you an example to highlight you know, how much difference you can see uh, in the data. This, this figure here plots the time series of one year had inflation expectations in the US for different agents. You have professional forecasters, you have asset prices, think about this as financial markets, you have households, that's the blue line, and then more recently we have some data for, for firms. And what you should see here is that early uh, in the 80s, maybe the 90s, the difference between households and firms, uh, households and professional forecasters was not that big. But then sometime in the 2000s, we start to see this massive divergence. You know, on average, the difference is going to be one or two percentage points. And that should not happen in a model where everybody agrees in the world, uh, where everybody agrees on the model, shares the same information set, and so on. And so here it's very clear that you should not use professional forecasters as a proxy for what households are doing. Now, you may say households are not really that important because they don't set prices. Uh, and I have several reactions to that. It's true, you know, some decisions are not made by households, but they make some very important decisions too. For example, how much to consume. It's not done by professional forecasters. It's not done by financial markets. It's done by households. They make these decisions, and so it's important to have expectations of households if we really want to understand what happens with aggregate consumption. Now, for a long time, we didn't have measures of inflation expectations for firms. This was one of the complaints from Ben Bernanke. Now, we have this data, and it's very clear that CEOs of US companies are not behaving like professional forecasters. The expectations look very different. If anything, they're closer to households than to professional forecasters. And again, something like this should not happen in a model in the world, I'm sorry, where FIRE is the right you know, framework to think about these issues. So we have these departures, you know, what do we do with this stuff? And as, you know, probably always true in economics, we have kind of two uh, camps that disagree on what to do next. You know, on the one hand, we have a very powerful, uh, you know, line of thinking basically saying we can't really measure expectations in surveys. You know, it's something unobservable, people are going to lie, they don't understand questions. There are lots of reasons why you want to be skeptical about a service as measures of expectations. And there is no question about that, that there is a lot of noise there, and people can give crazy responses to uh, various questions. But on the other hand, the other camp is saying that, well, we, we should take this evidence seriously too, because there is some grain of truth there, and uh, we shouldn't uh, reject this evidence just because it contradicts a beautiful theory. Right, so fire is attractive in so many ways. This is why it's so powerful in macroeconomics and other fields. Uh, 
but we should also be critical of this framework and try to improve it along various dimensions to make it more consistent with micro-level evidence that we see in the data. Now, so what do we do next? Okay, so next we are going to say how much difference it's going to make to have these departures, right? So maybe these departures are not really, maybe you reject the null that people have fire, but these departures are not big enough to really change your thinking or affect policy in a fundamental way. I'll give you two examples where this is going to make a big difference. The first one is about how we think uh, about counter-cyclical policy. For example, after the Great Recession in Europe, in the US, the main kind of struggle was to raise inflation and inflation expectations because the idea was that by raising inflation expectations, you're going to stimulate aggregate demand. Okay, and Mario Draghi gave this famous summary of how our models predict the reaction of the economy to this policy action. You raise inflation expectations, rail rates go down. When rates are go, go down, investment and economic activity improves. That's the reasoning, okay? So it's not just you know, QE, it, it's also true for forward guidance and other policy taken at this step. Now, this is true in our models, which are based on fire and full information rational expectations. Is this really true in the data? It's a big question. Is this really how people are thinking about inflation? Is this how they're going to react in response to this policy? And, you know, it's always very hard to answer these kind of questions because expectations are highly, highly endogenous. But there are some instances when we can have clearer sort of natural experiments that will tell us that, you know, what we have in our models is going to be inconsistent with what people are thinking about various, you know, issues in, in the economy. For example, during the COVID crisis, we see big divergence in how people are thinking about inflation expectations and economic outcomes. The red line here shows the evolution of expectations for professional forecasters in this period. Right, so you start in the second months of 2020, that's February before COVID takes over, you have very healthy expectations. Inflation expectations are anchored to 2%. Professional forecasters expect the gross rate of output to be between 2 and 3%. So this is kind of great conditions for the U.S. economy. Now, as the pandemic evolves, unfolds, right, so macroeconomists, professional forecasters, downgrade their macroeconomic uh, outlook, and they also reduce their inflation expectations, right? So this means that something like this can happen if you have a recession which is driven by on the net demand side factors. All right, so it doesn't prove that you know, we didn't have supply side factors, but on the net, this is consistent with the demand driven recession. Output is falling, inflation is falling, falling. This is as if aggregate demand is shifting down. Now, this is one take on what we see in the data. Here is another take on what was happening at the time. And this time, this blue line is for households. You start with a higher level of inflation expectations. And I already showed to you before in one of the previous slides that households consistently expect more inflation than professional forecasters. But more importantly, as households became more skeptical about the macroeconomic outlook, instead of reducing inflation expectations, they started to increase inflation expectations. So that's a very different interpretation. Instead of demand-driven uh, recession, you have a supply-side-driven uh, recession. It's a stagflationary view of the world. And in this kind of conditions, it's not clear you should be consuming more. Maybe you should be consuming less. And this is exactly what you see in other survey evidence. You ask people, is this a good time to uh, consume, to spend? You know, what is your saving rate? And you see that the saving rate, desired saving rate, and inflation expectations are positively correlated. So you raise inflation expectations, and according to households, instead of stimulating aggregate demand, you actually can force people to consume less. They withdraw. From, from, uh, from spending, because they take this is not a good state of the world, okay? Now, this is not just COVID. You see something like this in other times. For example, you take a cross-section of professional forecasters, and you ask, suppose you pick somebody who predicts above average inflation. What does forecaster predict for the gross rate of output? And you see a positive relationship. Above average inflation expectations are associated with above average uh, gross rate of output. This is consistent with demand-driven business cycles and some notion of the Phillips curve. This is what professional forecasters are thinking. Now, this is what households are thinking. A completely different picture. You have an above-average 
inflation expectation in the cross-section of households, this household is going to predict below average growth rate of output, the stagflationary view of the world. And there are lots and lots of work uh, documenting this fact. And, you know, Rupal Kamdar, one of my former students, has a, a job market paper on this. Now, this is one application where instead of stimulating aggregate demand, you can actually create an opposite effect. You reduce, you reduce aggregate demand, you reduce consumption. Here is another application, you know, why we should care about this as policymakers. Almost every speech we have from the Fed chair, the ECB president, the head of the Bank of Canada or Bank of England, any bank, everybody talks about the importance of anchored inflation expectations and their importance for macroeconomic stabilization. Now, we can have all sorts of definitions of anchored inflation expectations. I'll give you five criteria, five metrics. Inflation expectations should be close to the inflation target on average. There should be little disagreement about the inflation target. The revisions should be small because expectations should be insensitive to incoming information. Uh, there should be a lot of confidence in forecasts. Basically, if you ask people to report their subjective probability distributions for inflation expectations, they should be very concentrated on the inflation target. They should not show you know, they should not think inflation can be 10% or minus 10%. It all should be centered on 2% with very narrow confidence bands. Short-term and long-term inflation expectations should be high, uh, uncorrelated. Why is that? Because it doesn't matter what we have with inflation today. If you have successful inflation targeting in five years from now, in 10 years from now, what we have in terms of inflation should be very close in expectation to the inflation target. And so the correlation between short-term and long-term inflation expectations should be zero. Now, you go to the data, you look at this criteria, and you very quickly realize that you fail all of this criteria. You know, inflation expectations are not close to 2% on average. There is not a lot of agreement in the data. There is a lot, not much confidence in the air forecast. There is a lot of correlation, and the revisions are very, very large. Now, it's kind of hard to comprehend kind of the magnitude of these departures, but let me show you one figure which I think is very telling for the degree of inattention or unanchoredness we can have in the economy. Some years ago, before COVID, uh, we had a survey of uh, US uh, CEOs, um, and you know, this is a very select group of people in many ways. They are much more educated, they tend to be older, more experienced, they're financially literate, and so on. So these are the people who should, who should be much more informed about the state of the economy in general and monetary policy specifically, because so many of their decisions should depend on what they think about the future course of monetary policy. We had a very simple question for them. It was something to the effect, tell us about what you think is the inflation target of the Fed. To our great surprise, roughly a third of people said, we don't know which is really striking. This was done in 2018. The inflation target was adopted in the U.S. in 2012. So for six years, this was common knowledge that the Fed is trying to achieve 2%. Then another quarter of the respondents was basically telling us some philosophical take on you know, what monetary policy is doing and where it should go, but they would not give us a number. So this is this column to the right. I don't know, not usable. And then only roughly a quarter of people gave us a response that is reasonably close to the official inflation target of the Fed. This was really striking because these people should be some of the most informed in the economy, and yet they show this glaring lack of knowledge about the inflation target uh, in the US. Now, this does not necessarily mean that this is bad behavior. Keynes famously said, I want to make economic policy making as boring as dentistry, right? So you go to a dentist, you don't care what they do exactly. You just care about the results and as long as everything is fine, you don't know what, and you don't want to know what, what they're doing exactly. Maybe we have something like this here with you know, central banking. For 10 years, you have low and stable inflation. It doesn't really matter for most people if inflation is 1.9, 2.1, or 2%. You know, in the big scheme of things, it's not really something that here that is important in their lives, daily lives. So maybe we have something like this. But maybe we have this uh, you know, result for some other reasons, and we need to understand where it came from. Now, invariably, when I talk about inflation expectations and in general expectations, um, at some point, I'm going to face the question of 
uh, you know, how do we know it's not noise? You know, somebody can predict 100% inflation, some people can predict minus 100% inflation. How do we know this is useful for anything? And it is a very good question because it's true there is a lot of noise in the survey data. But on the other hand, there is a lot of systematic variation. And so there is something informative in these expectations that we should not ignore and we should use to understand macroeconomic dynamics and for policy making as well. And so in answering this very important question, I tend to focus on three components. One is that incentives are going to be important. The quality of expectations is going to vary systematically depending on whether it pays for a given agent in the economy to pay attention or not. Right? So if your decisions are not really sensitive to inflation expectations, you can assume or predict you know, 100 or 1,000 percent inflation. It doesn't really matter. But if your livelihood depends on the quality of inflation expectations, if you have money on the table, then your expectations are going to be very important to you, and you're going to pay attention to what has happened in the economy and act accordingly. So incentives are extremely important. The second component in answering this important question is about how people collect and process information. You have this cross-sectional distribution of beliefs. How do we know that people take some signals and incorporate them in their beliefs. There is some kind of process for incorporating new information, and these expectations are responding to whatever happens in the economy. That's a very important question. And probably the most important part in answering this question is how do we know that people act on those expectations? Right? So if somebody believes 1,000% inflation in the US, what this person should do? Like liquidate all positions and have gold or Bitcoin or whatever? or maybe it doesn't really matter for this person, and so this is then the, just an academic debate about what people think about something that is not important for them. Now, in the rest of my talk, I'll try to elaborate on each of these elements and hopefully convince you that each of these things is there in the data. In some ways, it's going to be imperfect, but in other ways, it's also going to be very, very clear that all of these three things uh, uh, are there. Let me start with incentives. Uh, we, we have a, a burst of inflation, right? And uh, one obvious question is, uh, are people paying more attention to this event than they used to? Um, and uh, to answer this question, you can look at basic survey evidence, and this uh, piece of evidence come, uh, comes from the uh, Survey of Consumer Expectations, which is run by the European Central Bank. It's a giant survey, 20,000 households, you know, really high quality questionnaires, survey frames, and so on. And, you know, one of the things they do, they have these modules of questions when the ECB governing council can insert questions and ask, you know, something that will help them understand what happens on the ground and how they can use this for policy. And one of the things they did at the time in early 2023, they, they had a question about do people pay more attention to inflation than they used to? And the answer is yes, you know, a lot more attention in the Eurozone opinion a lot more people are paying attention uh, to inflation in the Eurozone than before. Now, you pay more attention, does it mean you have some variation in expectations? And the answer is yes. The more attention you pay, the better quality of your inflation expectations. Right? So it's not just you pay more attention and somehow you, you are going to have uh, the same expectations. No, expectations are connected to the quality of expectations. So this is telling us that as macroeconomic environment is changing, people have strong incentives to pay attention, and they, they are doing this, and that's reflected in the quality of the expectations. Now, this is one example. Here's another example. This time, it's going to be from New Zealand from around 2015, when we run a survey of firm managers in New Zealand and ask them to report their perceptions of inflation and also their inflation expectations. And the hope was that, you know, people, managers, who have strong incentives to pay attention to the macroeconomic environment, specifically inflation, are going to have better inflation expectations. And that's exactly what we see in the data. This figure here kind of shows three metrics here, three dimensions. Suppose you compare managers who are just about to reset their prices to managers who are not going to reset their prices for a while. Now, if I'm going to reset my prices tomorrow, I know it's very important for me to have inflation expectations right, because if I fix my prices in the wrong place, I may get stuck with this for a long time. And so I should be more informed about inflation, inflation expectations, and so on. 
Now, if I'm going to reset my price in a year or two years, it doesn't really matter for me to look at this inflation numbers. It's not going to change my behavior. I'm already locked into a price, and I'm going to be stuck with this for a while, so I shouldn't really pay attention to macroeconomy. And that's what we see in the data. This uh, lower uh, diamond uh, is zero three months. This is what you see for managers who plan to reset their prices relatively soon. They have better perceptions of inflation expectations, and they have lower inflation expectations, which is closer to professional for customers. The degree of competition, same effect. If you have lots of competitors, you make a mistake, you're going to be out of business very quickly. So the quality of expectations is going to be higher. The slope of your profit function, if you change your price a little bit and you see no effect on the profit, then it doesn't really matter where your inflation expectations are. You know, your losses are going to be small. If the slope of the profit function is going to be very steep, it means the price of a mistake for you is very high, and you should be paying a lot of attention to what happens around you. And that's what we see in the data. Firms with steeper profit functions are going to have better inflation perceptions and expectations. Now, let me move to the second component of answering that important question. How do we know that expectations are important and there is some rationality there? Specifically, we want to know how people incorporate information. If they update their beliefs in some rational manner, that it's not just noise. There is a signal, and somehow the signal gets translated into beliefs. Now, in theory, this is very easy, right? You, you, should, th be, you should be thinking as a Bayesian learner. You, you wake up in the morning, you have your prior, you get some signals during the day. It may be TV, maybe radio, maybe the internet, maybe a lecture like this. You get your signal. And then in the end of the day, you will look at everything you have seen and heard, and you say, now it's time for me to form a posterior. And that posterior is going to be a weighted average of your prior and the signal that you have received. And the weight on the signal is going to be a function of the relative precision of that signal. So if I give you something which is very informative, very credible, you're going to react strongly to that signal. If I give you a piece of information that is not relevant for you, or it's not credible, or you already know it, then you're not going to react to that information. Okay, and so then the weight on the signal is going to be close to zero. So this G, the, the gain of the filter, is going to be very useful for us to think about not only information rigidities, but also what kind of information people know in the economy at the time. Now, so this is kind of simple in theory. In practice, it's very difficult because we know all sorts of information decisions are highly endogenous. Right. We have a lot of heterogeneity in cross-sections. Some people have more information than others for a reason, right? because it's important for their daily you know, working decisions or consumption decisions or other decisions. And so we can't really run a regression like this where we have posteriors on the left-hand side and prior and signal on the right-hand side, look at those coefficients and say, aha, you know, this is the degree of information rigidity or this is how people update their information sets. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, macroeconomists are not spoiled by exogenous variation, um, and so we, we are very limited in our ability to answer this kind of questions. But one thing we can do is to learn from our uh, microeconomics uh, um, colleagues and use randomized control trials where we can have a better control over what people are doing in terms of information and how they update their beliefs. In, in some sense, it's a very straightforward fr framework, and it's surprising that it has not been used uh, more often uh, in macroeconomics. But it's, it's, it's very intuitive. It basically has three stages. In the preliminary stage, you ask people to report their inflation expectations or some other expectations you care about. It may be about unemployment, GDP, probability of being fired. It doesn't matter, any, any kind of expectation. Now, then you move to the second stage where you flip a coin and a group of people is going to go into the control group and another group of people is going to go to the treated group. The treated group is going to receive a signal and you as an experimenter, you're going to control what kind of signal these people are going to receive. Most importantly, the distribution of people between the treatment and control group is purely random, right? So you flip a coin and this determines where you go. And as a result, these two groups, the control group and the treated group, they are identical in all respects. They have the same education, the same professions. Everything is the same in terms of distributions. The only difference between these two groups is that one group is going to receive a signal and the other group is not going to receive that signal. 
Now, once you're done with this stage, you move to the last stage, where you ask people to report their expectations again. Okay, and maybe a slightly different question, maybe there is some discrepancy between what you collected in the preliminary stage. But if at that third stage you see a difference between the treatment and control group, you know for sure that the only reason why you see the difference is because one group received that signal and the other group did not receive that signal. And that's going to be the power of randomized controlled trials where you control the flow of information, right? So you break this curse of endogeneity when you think about various information choices that people make. Now, what kind of signals you can give to people? Usually it's something very basic and very simple. It has to be a true fact, so you can't lie to people. Uh, but you can tell them something about inflation or GDP or unemployment or you know, distance to the moon. It doesn't really matter what you tell them. As, as long as it's you know, a factually correct information, this is a fine treatment. For example, in one of the exercises we do, we tell people about the inflation target of the Fed and see how they change their inflation expectations in response to that. That would be one example. Another example is if you care about macroeconomic uncertainty, you tell them about how much macroeconomic uncertainty professional forecasters have and see how people react to that information. Okay? So factually correct information, very simple. And it's also publicly available information. Right? So we are not telling them any secrets uh, here. The inflation target of the Fed is publicly known. Professional forecasters, you know, this is from the Philly Fed website. If you're interested in this, you can download this information at any time. Now, once you do the treatments, okay, and you do uh, collect the priors, the first stage, you do treatments, that's your signal, and the third stage is measuring posteriors, you can run a regression at that stage, and it's going to be very simple. Posteriors on the left-hand side, a prior on the right-hand side, a treatment dummy, and the interaction of the treatment dummy with the prior. And then you can have a very simple mapping from this regression, which you can estimate with OLS, to the theoretical framework we had in the first line. It's very simple. For the control group, we should expect that the coefficients should be such that posterior and prior should be equal to each other. So alpha should be zero, beta should be equal to one. Why is that? Well, it's because the distance between measuring priors and posteriors in survey time is very short. It's about five minutes. Sometimes it's even shorter. There is really no reason why something systematically should be different in the beliefs of people in the control group. You know, there may be some mean reversion, you know, some differences due to the changes in the wording of the questions, but fundamentally the slope for this group has to be equal to one. Now, for the control group, it's going to be different. Right? We're going to have an extra term, beta, I'm sorry, delta, and we'll have an extra term, gamma. What is this delta? Delta is the level effect, right? So if you systematically surprise people and move their beliefs in one direction, this is going to be captured in this change in the intercept, right? You're moving everybody up, delta is going to be positive. If you surprise everybody systematically on the downside, you're moving expectations down. That's an interesting object, but more importantly for us, is, is gamma. That's a more interesting for us. It's measuring for us the degree of informational frictions we see in the data. How do we know this? Well, compare beta plus gamma to what we have uh, in, the, in this you know, Bayesian learning framework. This beta plus gamma should be equal to one minus g, where g is the gain of the filter. We know beta is one, okay? So this is from the control group. So g is going to tell us something about how much people change their beliefs in light of the provided information, okay? And we know if people are Bayesians that this belief should be moving towards the signal you provide to them. Kind of heuristically, you start with say two households. You know, one household is expecting zero percent inflation, another household is expecting ten percent inflation, and you tell them the signal is five percent inflation. Then the zero percent inflation person should be moving towards five, and maybe his or her beliefs should be you know two, three, maybe four. You're moving towards five. You raise the inflation expectations for this household. Now, if you look at the household who initially started with a high number, say 10%, and you tell the signal is five, then this household should be moving towards five, and the posterior beliefs should be maybe seven, six, or maybe eight. It depends on the strength of the signal. If you have a lot of convergence towards five, you give a very strong signal. If you don't see a lot of convergence to the signal, then the signal is already known, or maybe it's not a credible signal. So this coefficient gamma is very, very useful for us very useful for us. 
It's also telling us that you know, if you start with the control group and that's going to be a 45 degree line, and then you do the same exercise, basically applied posteriors versus priors, the slope of that relationship should be less than one because people are moving towards the signal. Now, this sounds a little abstract, I know, but uh, maybe this example is going to help you understand the workings of this experiment. This is an experiment that Michael Weber, Oli Corbion, and I did uh, on the Nielsen Homeskin panel. So you have like thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people who participate in this. And usually these experiments are designed to our, uh, answer marketing questions. Like, you know, here is an RCT where people are looking at different shapes of toothpaste uh, and they say, well, you know, I like this size or this color. And this is how marketing companies learn something about uh, consumer preferences. But this kind of machinery, this infrastructure can be used also to test you know, various theories about how people form inflation expectations. So it's a giant sample. We do this experiment. We'll look at the control group. On the horizontal axis, we have prior expectations. On the vertical axis, we have posterior expectations. This is a bean scatter plot, so it's not individual observations. It's going to be each of these circles here is going to be an average of about 200, 500 uh, observations. And the reason why you do this, because there is so much heterogeneity in the data, it would be very hard to see anything systematic. So this bin scatter is a sort of non-parametric way for us to summarize the data. Now you regress posteriors and the priors for this group, and basically you find a 45 degree line. It's not exactly one, but it's very close to one. And the reason why it's not one is because we have differences in the wordings of the questions for the posteriors and, and the priors. But qualitatively, it's equal to one. Now, what happens for the treated groups? And here we have three treatment groups. One is told about past inflation, which at the time was 1.9%. One group is told about inflation forecast, which is 2.1% at the time. And one group is told about the inflation target of the Fed, which is 2%. So basically, each of these treatments is roughly telling people inflation should be close to 2%. Now, what you should see here is a rotation of this relationship between posteriors and the priors. For example, you take somebody who initially had 10% inflation expectations, you tell this person, well, you know what, a more reasonable number may be 2%. This respondent is then going to revise his or her beliefs and move towards the signal you, you give them, right? So you move from 2% towards, I'm sorry, from 10% towards 2%, and so you end up with something like 4%. You take somebody here who initially thought inflation is going to be 6%, you tell this person, look, 2% may be a more reasonable number, you take these guys and you move them here towards 2%. On this end, if somebody started initially with 0%, you move their expectations up. And if you look at households who believe that inflation is going to be 2% and you tell them, well, it's likely to be 2%, for these people, you're not going to see any change in their beliefs because they didn't receive any information. So this change in the slope, this rotation, is very informative for us because it's telling us how surprising, how novel this information is to these agents who participated in this experiment. If you have a completely flat line for the posteriors, this is telling us that your signal is completely credible. People immediately abandon their priors, so just jump to the signal. If this slope is not changing very much, if the control group and the treatment group are going to have the same slopes, is telling us that these agents already know this information or they don't think it's a credible signal, okay? So the change in the slope is very, very important. Now here you see a massive change in the slope, right? And this, this is something that should not happen if you have full information rational expectations because people should have known these signals. They should have known the forecast. They should have known the inflation target. They should not be surprised to hear actual inflation numbers. So in the very fact that there is this action here is, is very useful for us to thinking about what kind of information formation, information uh, formation process uh, you have in the data. Now you can take it to the next level and keep doing these experiments in different macroeconomic environments and see how the slope is changing. Like when you treat people in a high inflation environment, is it true that the rotation is relatively small because people pay more attention? or maybe it doesn't really matter. The strength of the effect is the same and maybe we should be talking about, you know, it's in the DNA of people that they don't pay attention to inflation and it's a completely different story. Now this is exactly what we did uh, recently. 
when we did lots and lots of randomized controlled trials in various places. And just to be clear, each of these points is expensive. Each of these RCTs is about $50,000. So, you know, if you ask for a revision in this project and would like to see a more data point, you should understand there is a cost to that. But, you know, if you are satisfied with the current set of RCTs, the data is very clear. If you start with a low inflation environment, there is a big change in the slope for the treated group when you present people with publicly available information about inflation. So this is basically saying that people are not paying attention to inflation. They are surprised to learn that inflation may be 2% or that the inflation target is 2% or the inflation forecast is 2%. Now, if you move here to a high inflation environment, to think about you know, Argentina, Uruguay, or Eurozone in recent months, here, the change in the slope is going to be much smaller, right? So you kind of tilt a little bit the slope of the treated group, but it's not a very big response. And this will be more consistent with a setting where people are closer to full information rational expectations. They already know those signals, okay? So this is telling us it's, a not, a, it's not a DNA story. It's really a choice that people make. All these information choices are really important, and they depend on the macroeconomic environment. Now, this is the most difficult part now. How do we know these expectations matter for anything that people do in their lives, for consumption, for employment, for pricing? And this is a very difficult question because most of the surveys are not collecting outcomes for these agents. You, for example, Michigan Survey of Consumers is not asking people how much you spend. It's not asking questions about you know, how much you, know, you want to demand in wages or what kind of labor you would like to supply. The same for firms, most of survey firms, firm service, I'm sorry, they, they are not collecting information above and beyond the simple questions, what do you think inflation is going to be? And so it's a difficult question, but in some instances you have a combination of actions and beliefs. But even in those settings, it's always very hard to establish a causal link because expectations are highly, highly endogenous. Now what do you do with this? Well, you recycle some of the insights we had earlier where we said, look, with this experiments, you can create exogenous variation in the beliefs because some guys are going to receive signals and some will not. And you can use this exogenous variation in beliefs to study how people are going to change their behavior in response to these signals. It's kind of in a nutshell, you had the previous three stages of the experiment, and then you add another one when you track people over time, or firms over time, and see if the treatment group and the control group are going to have different levels of consumption or different levels of prices or different uh, investment choices, okay? So here it's going to be very basic in the sense that we know how to do this. It's just a two-stage regression, an instrumental variable regression, where the posterior beliefs are going to be determined from this first stage and we know these treatments are created exogenously, so none of this stuff is going to be related to the error term here or here, and then we can have a causal interpretation of this coefficient here, B1, which is telling us you change inflation expectations by one percentage point by how much you say consumption is going to fall. Or you have another belief here, unemployment, GDP, you name it, and you want to know what will happen with prices or employment or export choices. You know, any decision you can think of. Let me give you two examples of how this can work. This paper here is based on the experiment I, I described earlier when we tell people in the nielsen homescan panel something about the inflation target or inflation forecast from the Fed or actual inflation numbers. We track these people over time and we can ask them, you know, did you buy a durable good? Yes, no, it's an extensive margin. We can also ask them, how much did you pay? We can also ask them questions, you know, did you buy this or that good? And in this table here, we focus on one dimension of these choices, which is did you buy a durable good uh, or not? And here, three months later, we look at the responses that these people have, and we look at how this is related to the posterior beliefs that people have for inflation. And remember, this is going to be instrumented with our experiment. And we see a very big negative coefficient here, saying that you raise inflation expectations by one percentage point, you're going to reduce the frequency of purchases of durable goods by roughly one uh, and a half percentage points. 
And this effect is fairly persistent. Even six months later, we see that these households continue to have lower spending on durable goods. So people really appear to have this deflationary view of the world. Raising inflation expectations is not going to be necessarily productive in this sense. Now, this is one example. You can have other examples. It doesn't have to be uh, inflation expectations. It may be related to how much macroeconomic uncertainty we have. We know there is a lot of work that kind of focuses on this issue. Nick Bloom was sort of a pioneer of this research. But you know, when Nick describes this literature, he keeps saying, look, you know, it's really hard to have a causal story for how uncertainty affects various choices made by firms and households because uncertainty, A, is hard to measure, and B, more importantly, it is highly, highly endogenous, okay? Now, we can use the power of this RCTs to create exogenous variation and uncertainty that people have about, say, aggregate growth rate of GDP and see how this translates into various choices that they make. So, for example, here, Oli Corbion, Dimitris Georgiakos, Jeff Kane, and Michael Weber, we, we do this RCT using this huge ECB survey of households where we do this RCT with different treatments, and then we can create exogenous variation in uncertainty that people have about the growth rate of output in the Eurozone. Okay, and so this number here is saying when you raise uncertainty by roughly one standard deviation, spending on non-durable goods decreases by five percentage points. That's a very strong effect, okay? But we would not be able to come up with these numbers if we don't use the power of this RCTs. Now, it doesn't have to be consumption. I keep giving you uh, consumption examples. It may be also related to financial choices. Uh, for example, we ask these people to uh, allocate a windfall um, we ask them, suppose you have 10,000 euros, how would you allocate this 10,000 euros across different asset classes? And it's clear that when you raise macroeconomic uncertainty, people are much less likely to invest in asset classes that they perceive as risky, for example, in cryptocurrency. And so there could be you know, other examples how we can use this in finance. Now, to conclude, let me give you a summary of what we have so far in this line of research. Again, this is very active and there is a lot more work ahead of us. One thing which is clear is that this full information ratio expectations is an extremely important framework, not just in macroeconomics, but also in finance. And you know, even Keynesians embrace this thing. But on the other hand, we see that there are massive departures from fire in the micro-level data, and we have to do something about this. It seems like micro-level evidence is telling us that there is something systematic in these expectations. Incentives are important, people process and collect information in a systematic manner, and they also act on those expectations, right? They change their consumption or portfolio choices. Fortunately for us, we have a lot of theoretical work that is trying to fill in this gap, come up with some frameworks which may be you know, as uh, you know, realistic as possible, but at the same time have the discipline of full information ratio and expectations. And we have already some successful alternatives there. It doesn't mean that we're completely satisfied with those choices, but we certainly have some, some ideas how to do it. Now, the reason why I'm saying we are not done there yet is because we have lots and lots of theories maybe like a thousand models of inflation expectations formation or some other expectations. And we don't really have enough empirical evidence to say this is a good model or this is a bad model. We need to have a lot more testing. And you know, one question is why don't we have that you know, exercise done? And in part it's because this kind of surveys are expensive. I told you $50,000 per RCT, that's expensive. But you know, it also has to be done by you know, institutions that can do this systematically. Like as a poor academic, I can't really do this over and over. It has to be done by the Fed or by the ECB or by some other institution. And this is especially so when you look at firms, right? Because CEOs are very busy people. If you reach them, you'll have maybe 30 seconds to ask your question and then disappear, right? So you have very limited control over uh, those people. And so what I see going forward is that we should have more of these iterations. I have a theory, here's a test, theory, test, theory, test, and keep doing this until we converge to a satisfactory model. Fire is a useful starting point, but I think we should experiment with other models. Now, in terms of policy, I think everybody should recognize that we have massive inattention most of the time. You know, people don't hear news about you know, various choices made by the Fed. Uh, many people didn't know that you know, some fiscal support is going to come their way during the COVID crisis. Uh, 
And so we should recognize that the span of attention is very limited for most of the people, most of the managers. And we have all sorts of information rigidities and human friction, so to say. We know that the quality of, say, inflation expectations is related to the IQ that people have, right? So some of this may be genetic, but uh, not all of this. We know from the example I gave you that the quality of expectations vary systematically with the macroeconomic environment. We also see a lot of misinterpretation, alternative interpretations of the data, lots of different models. Inflation is not as good as it's posed by our models. You know, many people think inflation is really bad, even though you know, our models are telling some inflation may be good for you. And we should recognize that there is this alternative view of inflation and there is heterogeneity in beliefs. Now, how should you communicate in this kind of environment? That's very interesting because you have to be simple and direct because people have very limited amount of attention. You have to give them the right perspective in the sense that you have to tell them a story, a holistic story explaining this is why we are doing this and it should be internally consistent to make sure that there is no misinterpretation. We should also probably focus on targets instead of instruments. Again, going back to the dentists, dentists are not telling you what they're going to do exactly. They just tell you, here is you know, the final point we want to reach and they don't bother you with various details that they're going to do. Maybe the same should be true for policymakers. They should just say, look, everything is going to be under control, inflation will be fine. We should have a lot of more infrastructure for measuring expectations and using them for policy, even asking hypothetical questions. What do you think you would do if you know, policymaker X is going to do action B? Okay, that would be very useful information. And finally, we should be prepared for sustained information campaigns, right? So if you ask me again to give this lecture in a few years, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be related to what I just said now. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri, for this great talk. Uh, let me start with some questions, and then I hope that others will join questions. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating of the graphs that you showed is this difference between household expectations and uh, survey pro or professional forecasters. Um, there was this older research by Andrew Ang, Geert Beckert, and Ming Wei that they were arguing that they were comparing different forecasts from different VARs or the regime switching models and then household expectations and uh, professional forecasters. And they found that the households actually do a good job in the forecasts. Is this, I don't know, this is an older paper. Is, is, the, is the more recent evidence? Um, it looked like the survey forecasters are way down while the households are way up. Is, is this... Uh, how does this look like right now? Are the households doing a smart forecast or? You know, it's remarkable that professional forecasters made such huge mistakes during the COVID crisis. They continued to predict 2% inflation for a long time, even when inflation started to really take off and there was a lot of perception among you know, just about everybody in the economy that inflation is not doing very well and we're going to face problems. And for example, if you look at this episode here and calculate forecast errors for households and professional for, and we can contrast this with professional forecasters, households are doing much, much better than professional forecasters. So there is some wisdom in the crowds that you know, these professional forecasters are not really utilizing. Maybe they rely too much on our instruction in graduate classes and they use wrong models, uh, or maybe they find the Fed to be too credible but in terms of you know, this empirical facts, the forecast errors of households during this time period are much, much better than professional forecasters. It's interesting, it reminds me of Jose Barrero's job market paper about optimistic managers. So these are all, in some sense, uh, financial professionals. I wonder whether they're selected to be overly optimistic and that's why they make these mistakes or whether there's some other story going on. Any other questions? Yuri, as a finance person, I'm a little surprised that you don't focus differentially on inflation swaps and break-even rates of inflation as they sort of represent a market reaction rather than a response to surveys. You mean why I'm focusing on why this red line is 
why aren't you telling us a little bit more about how accurate those things are relative to forecasts? Well, so here, I think, you know, if you look at the financial markets, and you can have some variations here. You can use inflation swaps or the spread between index and non-index bonds. Um, but in a nutshell, they continue to predict 2% inflation all the time. And so in some sense, their expectations were very anchored, very boring. And so the Fed could claim he uh, victory here by saying, look, this more informed people understand policy communication and they have anchored inflation expectations. But you know, having said this, you know, there was this big increase in inflation expectations in 2022, 2023, when uh, even this agents realized, well, you know, maybe the Fed is not entirely successful in controlling inflation and the outlook is not as positive as they promised it to be. You know, one interesting thing to do is to look at the dynamics of inflation expectations from, you know, this dot plots from the summary of economic projections. And for a long time, this was the most boring forecast, like 2%, 2%. Next year, we're going to have 2% no matter what. And only recently, they realized, well, it's not going to be 2%. But when you look at their long-term forecasts, it's always 2%. <laughs> so they now allow a possibility that short-term inflation may deviate from the target, but they continue to insist that they will bring the economy back to 2%. Yuri, this is fascinating. <clears throat> I'm surprised you didn't talk about, you emphasize expectations so that what people think would be inflation next year, but you can simply ask them what was inflation last year, mm -hmm. which is already a data point. Mm -hmm. And my prior, since you didn't show us what happens, my prior would be that you'd find exactly the same picture with priors and posteriors if you ask people about last year. And so that suggests it's not about expectation, it's about, well, if this is true, it suggests it's just general lack of knowledge about the economy. Right. And so how do you separate expectations and expectational errors from the general lack of knowledge about the facts about the world? Yes, thank you. It's a great question. It's true that perceptions of inflation is the single most important predictor of inflation expectations. So if you ask me, if you ask a typical household, what do you think inflation was over the last 12 months? And I'll tell you 5%. And then you ask me, what is my inflation forecast for the next 12 months? very likely I'll tell you 5% too. So there is a very strong correlation between perceptions and expectations. Um, now that's a great question, how we you know, think about the flow of causality. Is it from expectations to perceptions or from perceptions to expectations? Um, you know, that, that may you know, depend on lots and lots of sense. Uh, we know from some evidence that the flow is from perceptions to expectations. For example, if you buy expensive uh, carton of milk, uh, you will say, ah, you know, milk is expensive, it must be inflation, all prices are going to be high, and then you will form high inflation expectations. But it has nothing to do with aggregate level of prices. It's just one salient price that you saw, and this is what drives expectations. Same with prices of gasoline in the US. You look at short-term inflation expectations in the Michigan serve consumers, and the price of gasoline in the US, and the correlation is really, really high. It's like 0.8. So if you want to summarize inflation expectations in the US, all you need to know is just the price of gasoline. Now, whether this is about you know, uh, general knowledge about the economy or something else, that's an open question. And uh, kind of one objective I have in this lecture is to show that you can use this RCTs to figure out you know, why people have these beliefs. Okay, is this about the worldview that they have or the types of prices they, they, they pay or maybe something else? This is fascinating, and my question is kind of related to the previous question. Um, I wonder if you look at the cross-section, I guess the question is what inflation the forecasters are predicting. Are they focusing on the inflation they're experiencing? Um, so I would see you know, different households might be experiencing inflation very differently. Different firms and different industries might be experiencing different inflation. So I wonder if you have any cross-sectional, you know, looking at lower income versus higher income households, and maybe uh, firms in different industries with price more volatile versus more stable prices. Yes, thank you. It's a great question. There is a lot of systematic variation in the cross-section. Uh, more educated people have better inflation forecasts. Uh, here, this figure is showing, for example, that firms with small competitors have better inflation perceptions and expectations. Um, 
Now, the que one, one question is why we have this you know, systematic difference in the level of inflation. Uh, and some people say, well, there is really no explanation for why something like this should be happening in the heads of the people. But we should also realize that, you know, when people think about inflation, they don't necessarily make all the quality adjustments that is done by the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics. So if they buy a computer now and pay $1,000 and then buy another computer in a few, few years, they don't understand necessarily that this is going to be a cheaper computer uh, because it has more power. They continue to pay the same $1,000. And so right there, you can have an extra percentage point sort of in their inflation expectations. There is also a difference between, you know, when we ask those questions, is this about your consumption basket, is this about the general level of prices, or is this about the specific price index? And so some of these differences may be explained by that. You know, there is some work done by the Cleveland Fed economists where they try to zoom in into this and say, you know, if I ask you about specific categories of goods, are you going to have better perceptions and expectations? And the answer is yes. So in some sense, aggregate inflation expectations are the most confusing for people. But again, it doesn't mean that this variation is not informative. There is, you know, for example, you look here, there is a huge spike in inflation expectations. And then you read the Fed speeches at this time, and they will keep talking about how anchored inflation expectations are. And in my book, this does not look particularly anchored. But, you know, maybe from their perspective, it's close enough to 2%. So I have a completely different sort of question, which is more about the link between these non-rational expectations and decisions, which you're measuring empirically. But I think there's a philosophical question to be made, and much of the literature basically sometimes measures these expectations. I've done this in my own work, and then, and then we put it into a model in which the agents are perfectly optimizing, be that investment, consumption, portfolio choice. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear kind of what you think about how philosophically, how we should model decisions under these non-fire expectations? That's a very difficult question, but also a very important question. Why we see this departures? Is this because people have wrong models, or they have wrong information sets, or they just fail to incorporate information in, a, in the right manner? Or maybe they make some optimizing mis optimization mistakes at some, at some level. And so we can introduce this error terms in different places. Uh, without some notion of you know, randomized controlled trials, it's really hard to know for sure what is happening. Because um, you know, if you have an observational study and somebody is doing X and believes Y, you can say, oh, you know, there is some correlation and maybe we can make some inferences about this. But if you really want to understand you know, what is wrong with these models, you have to have some notion of randomized controlled trials to answer these questions. Now, having said this, I think in macroeconomics, there is a long tradition that you can't abandon rationality. It's too much, right? So you'll go to, I don't know, like Tom Sargent or others, and they will say, you know, just wilderness. Like, we, we don't know what to do there. We don't have any bearing or any guidance in this kind of environment. And it's true, you know, one, one, one reason why fire was so successful is because it gave you a lot of guidance, a lot of discipline, saying, like, you can't be right in only one way, and you can be wrong in many ways. And unfortunately, it's very hard for us to know in which way we're wrong. Is it way A or way B or way C? So I think, you know, in terms of, I guess, like editorial decisions and outcomes, it's clear that, you know, there is more traction here than here, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this was wrong. You know, maybe we just don't have enough evidence to uh, convince skeptics that we should have maybe diagnostic expectations instead of seeking for expectations. So I have a question. So how to run randomized trial controls in countries where, you know, the officially released statistics are not trustable? So because, you know, people, if the people don't trust uh, the signals you give them, so as a researcher, we have to give them a fake number. And if this is the case, the treatment effect is generated, but policymakers will never use that fake number. That's a great question. You know, one, one thing which is going to be important in this exercise is, is that you have to run every experiment by the internal review board. You know, somebody who is going to look at this and say, it's okay to treat human subjects in this particular manner. And number one requirement in this, um, you know, reviews is that you have to tell people factually correct information or something which is true to the best of your ability. And it's true in some countries, you go to Argentina, you don't have an official number, 
and maybe not a credible number, and this may be a constraint. But on the other hand, you can tell them something about readily observable prices. You can say, you know, the price of milk in Argentina in Buenos Aires grew from this number to that number, and that would be an example where you tell something about prices, informative to people, and uh, you tell them the truth. In some countries, you face different concern, uh, constraints. For example, if you go to Iran or China or maybe Russia now and you say something about inflation, people may be reluctant to say you know, what they really think about those numbers because they may think that you know, they may face some consequences after that. But in the vast majority of cases, you know, this is not really a constraint when you tell them the truth. When you, show, when you showed the, the, the cross-country evidence, I immediately thought, okay, what you're showing us is that people in Argentina where you have inflation moving around a lot are much more, uh, pay much more attention to inflation. But then the, the RCT, uh, where you show them what the inflation target is and they're really updating on that, that tells me that there, there's really more, that there's not, they're not understanding how monetary policy maybe works? Or That's for sure. That's for sure. You know, we spent so many years trying to understand how monetary policy works, and we still have lots and lots of open questions. And you can only imagine if somebody who is not particularly financially literate can understand, you know, about monetary policy decisions and, and so on. But, you know, having said this, we don't have Argentina in our sample. We have Uruguay, which, you know, it's probably as close, I mean, geographically, it's as close as you can get to Argentina. But also in terms of inflation, it consistently had uh, high inflation of roughly 10%. And we know that in Uruguay, firms are much more informed about the inflation target of the Central Bank of Uruguay, recent numbers uh, for inflation, and also inflation forecasts. So kind of 10% is almost like a threshold number when people become really attentive to, to inflation. So, so you, you, thank you so much for the for the presentation. So, so you talk about the mean uh, expectation. Can, I mean, I guess you know, in a context of a service, it's going to be hard maybe to to measure the the full distribution, right? So, I'm interested in the variance of the prior, and and you know whether you know ad, you know updating has to do with you know somebody with very wide priors, you know, basically has no idea and therefore might might react more to a to a signal that that somebody that has a very tight tight prior, and then sorry, and you know when you were discussing in the last slide the your your policy implications, you you talked about um, uh, the 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 importance of uh, public campaigns or information campaigns, but I'm so I'm I'm struggling a bit because you know going back to the discussion you were just having, um, you know people that. So again, Argentina, Uruguay, where there's high inflation, people are very accurate. And so providing information about inflation is not going to be that relevant, right? Whereas, you know, in countries like New Zealand, you know, 2% inflation, people don't care about inflation. And, you know, their prime might be super off because, I mean, they don't really care, right? I mean, you know, if you tell me about the price of gasoline and I ride a bike to work every day, I could not care less, right? So it's not going to be that. So, so again, the, the value of information campaigns might be undermined by the fact that, you know, people, you know, you know, there's a cost of acquiring information, but people that you know care about the information will will acquire it already, right? And so, and so, yeah. So it's it's unclear to me what what the value of information campaigns might might be in this in this context. Thank you. Yes, thank you for these two great questions. Uh, let me go backwards in terms of answering them. Um, one is about information campaigns. Should we keep talking to people about inflation and so on? Um, it's true this is going to be more relevant for periods like this when inflation is low and stable and people don't care about this. And so from the policy communication perspective, the main challenge is to grab the attention of people. And I must say, central bankers have been very creative. Like the Central Bank of Jamaica, they, they had a reggae song about the inflation target to make sure that you know, an average Jamaican can, can get this information. Um, but you know, it's a different challenge um, than what you face when inflation is high. It's true when you have an environment which looks like this, when you have high inflation and people are really attentive to what is happening in the economy, then policy communication should be focused on a difference. In. Instead of penetrating through this wall of inattention, you really should focus on convincing the public that what you do is you know, sensible, reasonable, and it's going to be effective. So they're already listening to you. You don't need to work on inattention. It's more about credibility and convincing people that you have a 
a credible plan. I agree with you, it's a different set of challenges. And so when I was talking about information campaigns, I mostly meant that you know going forward when inflation is going to be low and stable again, this is going to be the main challenge for policymakers. Uncertainty and updating, exactly right, right? So um, not every survey is collecting some measure of uncertainty. You, it, it's a difficult question to ask. Most people don't understand probabilities or percentages. Uh, and so in, in some ways it's cognitively very demanding, especially if you imagine do this survey on the phone. But you know, if you're willing to pay the cost of doing this, you first of all see there is a lot of variation in terms of uncertainty. Some people have a lot of confidence in their forecasts. Many, many people are not very confident. They can tell you, well, inflation can be anywhere between zero and 50 or zero and 1,000. Some people will be you know, very precise in their expectations. But consistent with your uh, uh, conjecture hypothesis, it's true that people who have less informed priors are going to respond more strongly to credible signals. So if I can say initially anything goes and I give you a credible signal, I am more likely to jump to that signal and revise my beliefs by a lot. And if on the other hand you have somebody with a very strong prior, very precise prior, you give those people signals, they will respond, but their response the magnitude of their response is going to be a lot smaller. Hi. So uh, in macroeconomics, uh, typically when we talk about inflation, inflation expectations, we, we also talk about unemployment and also link between inflation, unemployment, essentially Phillips curve. So provided that inflation expectations that we see in the data are, like as it was on one of the previous slides, like are like off, is it practically useful to approach uh, uh, adjustments in the interest rate like in the context of essentially Phillips curve? Uh, or like, what is your assessment of that? Of that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a very important question. Are we living in this world or we are living in this world? And at least in terms of the cross section, we know when the Fed is saying something uh, professional forecasters are going to interpret this through a Phillips curve, you know, the source of business cycles and so on. Households are going to have a very different lens to look into, into this. And that's a big challenge because when you communicate with the general public and you say, look, we're going to raise inflation because it's going to be good for you, they're not going to think that you're going to reduce unemployment. They will think, okay, you're going to create more unemployment for us, and that's not a good thing. Um, now, why people have these beliefs, it's a great question. And again, I want to mention this job market paper by Rupal Kamdar from some years ago, where you develop a model about what people should care about. And in a nutshell, you know, think about the Phillips curve. Moving along the Phillips curve is not very costly. You, know, you have more unemployment, but also less inflation, so your purchasing power is less affected. Now, if you have a shift in the Phillips curve, then that's going to be really costly for you because you increase inflation and unemployment at the same time. And so if people have limited capacity to collect and process information, they are going to direct their attention to shifts in the Phillips curve instead of movements along the Phillips curve. And so from their perspective, it makes total sense to have this interpretation of the data. Well, let's thank uh, Yuri again, and let's conclude this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.